Good afternoon and welcome to the weekly show with Mike Hayes where I bring you news, commentary, and interviews from around the cannabis industry. Today is Monday, July 27th, 2020, and it's my third episode. If you hear any construction noise in the background, that's because of a big project happening on my street. Check it out, I even got a time lapse. Pretty neat. Our main story tonight is an interview with a patient of MindBloom, a company that is leading the way into legal psychedelic medicine. It's an interesting interview for a couple reasons. First, it's an exciting young industry that cannabis professionals are already jumping into. And second, it's a fascinating personal story of what it's like in 2020 to have a doctor sending you legally prescribed ketamine through the mail directly to your house. But before we get to that interview, let's get to the news. Our first story tonight is an exciting development as MedFarm secured Denver's first cannabis license for research and development. For a long time, scientists have complained that the only cannabis they're allowed to study is of seriously poor quality. And they're not exaggerating. Take a look at this photo comparison. It's like studying alcohol's effect on the body by drinking paint thinner. But MedFarm's new license will allow the Schwa's subsidiary to obtain real-world cannabis products to study real-world effects. No sticks, no stems, no seeds. Said one top scientist, some real sticky icky icky, ooh wee, put it in the lab. Well, use the code, dear. Meanwhile in Washington DC, it's cannabis in Congress, and I made a whole video about it. Yes, a congressional whistleblower reported this month that Attorney General Bill Barr had inappropriately ordered antitrust investigations into tiny cannabis industry mergers that didn't call for it. Barr did this even after his own experts assured him that no cannabis companies were anywhere close to winning Monopoly, and most were still looking for the cards to pass go, collect $200, and even get out of jail free. Also out of Washington, D.C. this month, Senator Cory Booker said that he and Bernie Sanders have, quote, consistent conversations regarding cannabis justice. Consistent conversations, eh, Corey? We get it. You and Sanders are burning one down on the regular. Love it. Please continue, Senator. This is why you and I talk about marijuana justice all the time. I'm very angry. I'm, I'm all for legalization. I came to the Senate and started speaking about legalization. But to say that in the same breath and not to include expunging records, reinvesting profits into communities that have been economically devastated by the drug war, you're not talking about justice if you suddenly say, okay, everybody start from the same field. Well said. So today we actually have two updates on this topic of making sure that cannabis profits flow into the communities that were targeted by the war on drugs. First, here in Colorado, we embarrassingly passed our very first social equity program, and the governor visited Simply Pure, America's first black-owned dispensary, to sign it into law. Meanwhile in LA, activists are skeptical as the city council tries to reform the social equity program that has gone three years without a single license issued. Apparently the city's rallying cry has been, if not us, then who? And if not now, how about in three years? Also, it wouldn't have to be us by then, right? Now on the corporate side of the industry, Acreage Holdings reportedly lost two thirds of their value after accepting a $15 million loan at 60% interest. 60% interest. I haven't seen that kind of outrageous markup since my college friends were selling dime bags to the trust fund kids. Wait a second, who's on the board of directors at Acreage Holdings? Same kids. And finally, my favorite news story of the week. An Oklahoma dispensary has agreed to change their name after a trademark dispute with a local institution. Yes, apparently the Bank of Oklahoma was concerned that the Dank of Oklahoma might confuse customers with a similar logo and name. No word yet on what the new name will be, but I'm personally pulling for Weeds Fargo or Goldman Dime Sachs. And apparently it wasn't just the name and logo. The dispensary will also have to change their What's in your dank account slogan. Said one confused customer, Dank account? You were saying dank account this whole time? What happened to all my cash? Yes, it's another sad story of Americans victimized by big danks. And that's our news. And now it's time for our interview. Our interviewee, who we'll just call Liz for privacy, is a friend of a friend who is currently going through ketamine therapy for major depressive disorder. We're going to ask her about why she sought out this treatment, why she chose MindBloom, and what her experience has been as she heads towards her first session. Check out this conversation and stay tuned for a follow-up interview coming soon where she breaks down what the experience was like. 
check it out. Thanks, Liz, for talking to me about um, this experience coming up and uh, just having this discussion. Let's just start with um, what was your journey to getting interested in this ketamine therapy and go from there? Yeah, so um, I have been in treatment for um, major depressive disorder um, since about 2002, 2003. So I've been in therapy on and off this entire time. And I find that in general, the, the medications um, themselves don't give much relief or they give some relief, but only so much. And that even with all the different therapy I've been through, ultimately, you know, I have come to a greater understanding of what the underlying causes are of my depression, but I haven't been able to get to that next level of like actually treating it to a point where I feel I'm living like my like fullest life and and in a way that um, I don't go in and out of these like you know peaks and valleys about a year like last summer I actually spoke to my prescribing um, uh, nurse practitioner about trying out ketamine and they said that they had no issue with it but they personally don't have any practitioners at the clinic that um, use the drug I did the research into the esketamine and into the IV infusion clinics and came to the conclusion that it was just prohibitively expensive. Um, I would uh, have had to spend roughly about like $10,000 on the IV infusion to get the full course of treatment. And so I just, I tabled it um, until recently when um, a friend of mine recommended this service called Mind Bloom, which uh, offers the medication in a tablet form that you take uh, under the tongue and it dissolves. And because of that method of um, treatment, it is much more affordable, even if you're paying out of pocket. So four treatments come out to about a thousand dollars and that's inclusive of all the counseling that they give, um, the kit itself with the medication and, and other tools and things that they give along with it, which I could get into more in a bit. So what's your understanding about what, how this is supposed to work or why ketamine has this ability? With the ketamine, it works on a totally different system, like the glutamate system. I'm not really like, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> uh, so, but my understanding is that like, unlike all the other classes of antidepressants, this works very differently to kind of rebuild the, uh, the neural synapses that um, have been damaged by the depression. So there is a, there is a, a real physiological component to it um, when they've, they've looked at it under like MRI when the patients have been in MRI machines. Um, but that also the other layer to it is, is the actual experience of taking it, the disassociative effect that it causes and even hallucinatory effects, similar to other types of, um, you know, so-called psychedelic drugs that it can impact the way that you perceive yourself in the world at large and that somehow that has a positive long-term effect um i don't you know I've, I've i've seen and read a lot of different you know versions of this like some people have like a very like strong um reaction others it's more mild um so yeah we'll, we'll kind of see I've never personally had a strong psychedelic experience. I've, I've dabbled in uh, low dose, like microdosing of psychedelics. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, how, this, how this goes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little more about like what the process has been. So you chose Mind Bloom because it was accessible, it was affordable because you can actually do it at your house through this dissolvable tablet instead of having to go into a clinic get um, an IV actually into your arm. So once you made that choice, you signed up for Mind Bloom. like how's that process been going? There's a screening, first of all. So if you have certain pre-existing conditions, like medical conditions or a history of suicidal ideation within the last month or so, they uh, exclude you from being able to take the medication. So I had to first go through um, a screener online and then again, uh, like do the interview with the, um, the psychiatric nurse um, who will be um, working with me throughout the whole process. And so she gave me um, the same screener and asked me a bunch of questions. And then we, we talked about what, what it's going to be like, you know, the, you know that I'm gonna get this, this medication in the mail. Um, it comes with, um, I will also get an anti-nausea medication because some people feel they get a little bit nauseous at the beginning of it, so that I'll get that. 
I also got a blindfold, uh, like mask, like eye mask, um, a journal, um, a blood pressure med uh, uh, monitor. Um, they they want you to check your blood pressure before, during, and possibly after. I have to go look at the literature again. Um, there's also a component of you need to have a monitor, like a buddy system, basically. So um, since it's being done remotely, um, you'll check in with the clinician right before the treatment starts. And then you have to have, and during that meeting, your buddy will be there to also listen to all of the different things that they need to do. You know, check your, your, check your blood pressure, come in and check on you every 15 minutes, make sure you're doing okay. You're not allowed to get up on your own if you have to go to the bathroom, um, for instance, um, that's what they're there for, is to like walk, walk you over to the bathroom and just keep an eye on you, make sure you're safe and comfortable. And then um, when it's all said and done, um, you, you check back in again, we do a, like a, another Zoom, it's gonna be through Zoom or some like platform like that, where you'll discuss like what the experience is like, kind of process everything. They, in between the end of the treatment and the next, and that that meet that video call, they want you to also journal. So they want you to write everything that you recall from the experience and your thoughts and 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 feelings. So um, it's kind of a comprehensive holistic approach. Um, for, again, like that also appealed to me because um, with the IV infusions, most places it's like they just hook you up to the IV. They you know they put on some music and they walk away and they come back and they're like, how are you doing? Okay, fine, you can go home. Um, so it doesn't there's no requirement that you have therapy along with it they don't even like i mean they did say that um they would talk to my the psychiatrist the psychiatric nurse said that she would speak with my therapist that i'm seeing right now just to touch base but it's not required but the fact that they even offer that i think already shows that there's like there's more involvement um a, a multidisciplinary approach to it how long is the session about um, not including the before and after, like check-in, it's like about an hour. So the whole thing will take about forty-five minutes to an hour to go through the entire the entire treatment with the ketamine. Um, I think it takes the peak of it is about twenty to thirty minutes in, and then and then between like twenty and forty-five minutes, you'll like you'll have the experience, and then you start to come down the last fifteen minutes. So you said that they offered to talk to your like therapist you already see. Is there like a therapy um, session with the psychiatric nurse? Are you talking to her about, you know, yeah, intentions during the experience or how you're going to think through your thoughts when you're in the experience? Like, what has she kind of guided you through? Yeah, there's that's going to be the pre um, meeting uh, to discuss my intentions for the therapy. They want you to be as comfortable as possible and and also, you know, talk about what your expectations are and what you plan to get out of it. Um, and it's also just a way to sort of, you know, calm people because some people might find it a frightening experience. And so um, being, you know, clear on what the intention is, what's going to happen, um, any expectations you have, um, and so on, uh, help make it a smoother process uh, for the patient. So that, that's, that's the plan. So you haven't yet had those kind of conversations with the psychiatric nurse, but like just 10 or 20 minutes before you take the treatment is when you'll have the, that initial conversation. And then that's one, correct. And then one right afterwards. And then are there multiple sessions? Yeah, so typically they, they you are signed up for four sessions. Um, the next, the, the next three um, are more self-guided. They'll give you materials online to go through. Um, you can still always contact them. They also set me up with a consultant um, via text that I can, who um, herself apparently was a patient and now works for Mindbloom. So you can also talk to them about the experience and get some feedback if there's any, you know, um, thing that you, any concerns you have. Um, so yeah, there's, they, the reason why they set it at four is because some people after the first one feel that they need a higher dose. They start, the, the way the dosing works is completely based off of your weight. Um, and so they don't really know exactly how much you're gonna need until you do it. So the, basing it off the weight is really just the way that they typically work with anesthetics anyway, right? So they weigh you and get your height and they make sure that they're giving you the appropriate dose. But it's not necessarily therapeutic based on anything else. Like they don't know how I'm going to react. Like I, it might be like 
just just below the psychedelic level, like just kind of like a like a lubricant. But you know, they what their goal is to get me like just a little bit above that level, but not totally. They said in like outer space, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so we'll know better after the first time, and then the second time I'll, they can adjust it accordingly. And also, I think there's there's sort of a I don't know if it's like so much of a buildup as much as um, each time you come away with you know, a different experience. And so cumulatively, they find that it takes at least four sessions to have the most robust um, effect. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And I know that we both are kind of reading through the Michael Pollan book, um, How to Change Your Mind. And they talk a lot about like the trip sitters or the clinicians in that book and the role that they play, especially, I suppose, in like a six hour psilocybin trip versus, you know, a 20 or, or 45 minute um, ketamine trip do you feel pretty comfortable with like the support that they've given you do you um like yeah i think it's been i think it's been really reassuring also it's interesting to bring that up about the the difference in how long the trip is um i think that's also a big uh um uh positive for me that it's if it's not pleasant it'll be over you know versus like six hours where you know a lot i mean you really have to set aside a whole day and like it 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 could it could be good it could be bad or, or or somewhere in between so you know the worst case scenario is it's an hour and then it's over and we'll see how it goes so um yeah i think that it's also having you know the psychiatrist nurse having my partner there um we're, we're planning to actually do it um on a trip upstate um we're heading up um on monday so it's actually scheduled for next saturday and so i felt that that was like a good time and place to do it because we'll be in a very quiet place in in the woods and you know there won't be any like disturbances pre-covid actually you could go to their clinic to do this um they still did it with the sublingual tablets but um you were able to go in person and now given the circumstances they're 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 able to send it to people's homes there's like a, a special compound pharmacy that puts together the the kit and and mails it directly to you well that's most of my questions but i'm just curious to kind of open-ended you know how are you feeling about the session coming up and um why did you want to have this conversation and how do you feel about the whole idea yeah um I feel fairly, I mean, I would say I am a little bit nervous because um, I just, at the end of the day, like, no matter how many different videos I watch the people doing it, even from watching all those different clips, I still have no idea what, what to expect. Um, I just hope that, uh, to me, I'm almost more, like, interested in just, like, the outcome, like, how am I going to feel afterwards versus the actual being in the middle of it does that make sense um although maybe the two are intricately linked and you can't really separate them right so um that said uh the reason i wanted to have this conversation was that uh i think this kind of speaks to a larger issue of just how mental health is treated in this country which is not very well um even if you have resources like i do in terms of having health insurance that covers for treatment which i'm very fortunate and privileged to have you still get the run around um and don't really get um treated it, it, they almost treat like your condition and not you as a person and that's how i felt a lot of the time um especially with those who prescribe medication i think It'll be good to chat again, maybe afterwards to kind of do a uh, a post yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, on on how how things went. Um, yeah, and I think it is. I mean, I'm sure you feel that you're playing some small role to start changing the conversation about mental health and about these alternative therapies, and I definitely think you are. So, thanks for having this conversation with us and being as frank as you've been. And yeah, let's definitely talk again um, on the other side of it and see um, how you felt about it. Right. Thanks, Mike. And don't forget to subscribe below.